concerning a new era. I'm not going to spend much time on it because I want to get to so we can see what taking the city of how it fits. Does anyone remember uh, any of the components that we have preached on concerning the dawning of a new era? Give me one of them. What is it? Positioning? No, that's not it. I'm talking about the various different parts that we preached on. Let me give them to you so that, so that you can have them. Truth over reality is one. Agreement is the second one. Displacement. I know I'm going to go back to them. Don't worry. Displacement is the third one. And I'm adding two more. Removing strongholds. That's, that's where we uh, are. And maybe the two, four, fifth one. We may have more than five, but the fifth one is going to be to uproot the spirit of Jezebel. Okay, we go back. One is truth over reality. Okay, two is agreement. Three is displacement. Four is removing strongholds. And then five is uprooting the spirit of Jezebel. Now, uh, let me, I'm not going to talk about all five of these, but I will go all the way through where we are, which is dealing with strongholds. One, remember what we dealt with when we talked about truth, okay, over reality. Anybody remembers anything about that? Now, this is teaching, okay? We're teaching you because a lot of times you get encouraged with the preaching and the anointing and et cetera, but teaching gets down in your heart. I want to teach you. Does anybody remember anything about uh, truth over reality? Remember the example we gave from 1 Kings. Is it 1 Kings? Somebody check it real quick. 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. It may be Second Kings, but uh, it's where Elisha, the prophet at, after Elijah. Ah, thank you, bro. It uh, just put, sit him there. It that was that story. It, is it First Kings or is it Second Kings? Anybody's arrived there? Look at verse one. Is Second Kings okay? Second Kings, chapter what six? Second Kings chapter six is what we dealt with in the Old Testament concerning truth over reality. Now you remember the story. Now listen, you have to you have to remember these components because you see, listen, look at what we're looking at. I'm going back through with you what four five weeks of preaching to you, and all of it is not in you, and we got to get it in you. This, this principle of truth, okay, over reality brings you into the place of understanding that not only is there an unseen realm, but this unseen realm has power and authority over the seen realm. Okay? You, if you look at the example we did in the Old Testament, we saw that... Uh, when Elisha was revealing to the king of Syria, all the king of Syria battle plans, the king of Syria sent his army to arrest him and to get a hold of him. And the servant came out that morning and saw the city surrounded with chariots. And the prophet told him, it says, there's more with us than with them. You have to remember that. You have to remember that under this heading, of truth over reality. There's more with us than against us. There's more with us than with them. You have to remember that. That's something that sometimes it doesn't seem like it's that way. But it is if you're born again. It is. There are unseen. Now remember, listen to me. Because the things are unseen, it doesn't mean that they're not quote unquote real. Okay, when was the last time you made a cell phone call? Today, tonight, probably when you got here. You didn't see the waves go out. You didn't see it. 
but it was real because somebody answered the phone if they wanted to talk to you. You, 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 you got to get these things in perspective and you have to understand that whether you're born again or not, there are unseen forces dealing with you. That's where you have. See, sometimes we think in, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, abstract. We think, OK, we're out here. When, you know, we're out here. We're not born again. So there's nothing dealing with us. Yes, there is stuff dealing with you that you can't see. And more likely when you're not born again and not believing the Lord, you don't believe that there are unseen things out there. But a lot of times it testifies to you that there is. Because I don't know about you, when I wasn't saved, there was things that was driving me. I didn't know where they were coming from. But they were there. They were having an impact on me. Now, when I got saved, I began to see that there is also an unseen that has authority over these things. And so we dealt with the truth over reality in that story. Elisha said, Lord, open up his eyes. See, that's critical. Our eyes need to be open. There are things that are hindering our life that we are just pushing to the side and trying to work through with our human force. Oh, I'm going to work through this. I'm going to get through this. Yeah, it messed with me that time. I'm going to get over it. You see, and we try to work through that thing. And you're trying to work through something that you can't see. That is totally and absolutely a, a different way of fighting. You can't fight things in the spiritual realm with physical force. You can't even fight them with the human will. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And so we need our eyes open. Look at somebody and tell them, ask God to open up your eyes. Tell them that. Right. Ask God to open up your eyes. We, had, we need to see some things. And I can guarantee you, the Lord has showed some of you some things and you won't accept it. You got to accept it. You got to accept it. If something's going to be done about it, you have to accept. You, you have to believe God that when you seek him to get his wisdom and for him to open up your eyes, that he is going to do that. But don't be the problem. When he opens it up, you don't like what you see. The reason why he opened it up and you don't like what you see, because now you got to grab a hold of this. This is real, real, real. When he uncovers certain things to you, one of the reasons why he opens up your eyes to them to let you know that in him you can conquer it. Because I want you to think about it. Why in the world does he open up your eyes? Does he, does he just open up your eyes for you to see? You know, he doesn't just open up your eyes so you can see. He opened up your eyes so you can see because you have the power and authority and ability in him to do something about it. There are many people falling by the wayside. Wondering why didn't God do something about it? And it wasn't God's place to do something about it. It was their place to do something about it. You have the authority to do something about it. And so we put it on God. And God's not putting it on us. It, it, that's just the way it is. He's given us authority. And our eyes need to be open concerning that. So the servant's eyes were open. And what did he see? Now, you got to be specific in what he saw. That's not what it says, huh? What does it say? There you go. And guess what? Okay, I tell you what. Somebody says, Crystal, you getting there? He saw, first of all, what they saw was the natural eye was horses and chariots surrounding the city. Now, you got to be specific. When his eyes were open, he saw what? What does it say? Says, Christy, you got it? Do I need to go there? Well, let me go there. I got my Bible. Hey, praise the Lord. I have my Bible tonight. All right. Physical. Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 6 and uh, verse 17. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. 
Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain. Catch that. Okay, let's, let's go back and prove this. Uh, look at... Um, Look at verse 15. Come on, we need to be exact with this. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. You, would, you catch me. Now catch me now, look. And when his eyes were opened, the young man, he saw and behold the Mountain, not the city. The mountains were surrounding this whole city. The mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So what you have is the city and this army you can see surrounding the city. But when God opens up your eyes, you now have an army that surrounds that city, the army you can see, and everything, and is surrounding that whole thing with horses and chariots of fire. Now, the whole emphasis, the whole point I'm trying to make is it wasn't that these forces were just there, right there where the other horses and chariots were. They were surrounding them to give you a picture and understanding that God had this thing in control. Amen. Nobody was going to slip out. God was in control and everything was in place that he had the enemy surrounded. Couldn't get away, okay? Now, this, this was an Old Testament picture of what we talked about when it came to truth over reality. When you're born again, you must understand that you come into a place to where you begin to see and know according to God's word and faith in God's word and what it really is that there are forces fighting with you, fighting against you, that you can't see with your natural eye. But what you have to do is understand that there's more for you than for them. There's more with you than with them. There's more with you than against you. Are you with me? And I, I don't know whether, whether you, you grab a hold of this, but you see, if you let the scene change your opinion, thinking that you have lost. That's it. That is it. Because you're looking at it in the scene. This doesn't change, folks. The numbers doesn't go down in the unseen realm for you. They always more than what the enemy has. It depends upon what you are going to not only activate, but stand in authority and step out in that anointing and what's available to you. It's just like a person fighting a war and you got a big wall full of nothing but weapons and you want to choose to fight with a butter knife. You got a bazooka, you got a missile, you got everything you need back there on the wall. All you got to do, all you got to do is step out and grab a hold of it, pull a trigger, bam! Oh, but no, you want to spread butter. Are y'all catching? I'm trying to paint you a picture and I'm staying on this one too long, but I want you got to get this. You can go through, uh, through the word. How the word, how all the stories in the words and how all the things happen. We pick one out of the New Testament under this heading. What was it? It was when Peter walked on the water. What happened? First of all, what happened was, and you have to take it for what it says. Jesus came walking on the water and when they saw him, when they saw him, when they saw him and they evaluated the situation, what happened? And they were what? You hear that? You hear that? You see, fear works in the reality as well as in the unseen realm. 
it's a known fact that certain animals that are predators, they can smell fear. And when they smell fear, guess what they do? Thank you. Say it loud, Sister Rosemary. Mm, they attack. That's what they do. Because they know they have the victory because whatever they're dealing with is fearful. Why do you, I, I, I hear people talk about that in certain situations, you know, things that come up on you, you don't run. Why? Why don't you run? Because you are inciting attack. Now, that's in the physical world. The enemy uses fear to grip us, to paralyze us, but the whole thing about it is to overcome us in a, an existing situation to bring us into bondage so we don't function like we can or like we know how or like we even done in the past to God's capacity of functioning. Fear does that. And what God has promised us is perfect love cast out fear. The enemy will infuse in your mind that the reason why certain things are happening to you is because God, whatever. See, he uses that so that he can demean and demise your thoughts on the personality of God and who he is and whether he's going to come to your rescue or not or et cetera, so that you can begin to think thoughts that God's not with you. And then the moment you express that out of your mouth, all that stuff comes up on you. I hope y'all quiet because y'all listening. Okay, okay. So what, did, what happened with Peter? Jesus came walking on the water. They saw him. They were afraid. He calmed them by saying, it's me. Okay? Peter and his attitude and personality, okay, if it is you, Bid me come. He said, come. Did he walk on the water? Yes. Brother Rain, you read the story. Did he walk on the water? Yes, Presence, did he walk on the water? Brother Glenn, what you think? He did. Now, what does that tell you? Come on. What does that tell you? What is it, brother guys? He had faith in what? He had faith in if Jesus could do it and if I ask him he'll let me do it too you ever read this scripture you know greater works are you going to do because I'm going back to my father that's the you know that's the second part of this new era hadn't even got to it not even close to getting to it the second part is to continue the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth and he had a ministry of not only miracles, but he had a ministry of healing the sick. Now, there's nothing in us. It's all in him because we are in him. See, that's another principle that we have to get ingrained and understand. We're in him. There's still too much religious church in, in a lot of us. And what I'm talking to you about is you have to begin to start governing your life by what we're teaching. I'm not trying to say that I'm, I'm a great teacher. I'm trying to say the word is great and the revealed word is greater to the point that God is speaking something to you that you need to follow. You need to understand that there are things that God is revealing to you that you haven't seen with the natural eye, that there's stuff going on in the realm of the spirit, and that's the way you need to attack it. The enemy, one of his schemes is to allow you and get you convinced that you can attack a lot of this stuff in the natural. And you don't think it's the natural, but it is the natural. Because the weapons you're using are weapons of flesh. Huh? Okay. All right. So, can I, can I leave that one? I mean, there's other examples, but can I leave it and get you to understand? Well, before I leave it, Peter walked on the water. But the Bible says, when he looked around. And it didn't say he looked around. But, but that's what it's inferring. It's almost like 
he was in a bubble. All he was focused on was Jesus said to come. And if you look at it, if you want to be specific, it says that he asked Jesus to come to him. And he stepped out of the boat and walking to Jesus. And it's like it's giving you a picture that his focus was totally on Jesus. Until he start letting his gaze be taken away by the wind and the waves. And see, that's what happened to a lot of us. We're focused on the Lord Jesus, what he has said, what he said in his word, what he has revealed in our hearts. We're focused on it, but something happened in the natural to shake that focus up, and we begin to get our gaze off of Jesus and what he has said, and we begin to see the wind and the waves. Now, when we see that, look at what the impact it has on Peter, and it has the same thing on us. The Bible says when he saw that, he started to what? Sink. Now, think about this. His focus was on Jesus. He was walking on water as long as he focused on Jesus. Now he gets himself, you know, dislodged and focused on other things, and he's sinking, and guess what he have to do? He don't try to swim it out. He don't try to tread water. He cried out, Lord, save me. See, it's in Christ. It's nothing of your ability. It was nothing of his ability. But, the, but listen to me now. The thing that you had control of and possess is what you focused on. That's what you have control of. Am I not right about it? You had control of that. Not the Lord. And so when you let something distract you from what God has said, there are going to be some things that happen. Yes, sir. Which part? Hmm? Mm -hmm. When, you, when you remove your focus... From Jesus and what he has said and the revelation that he's given you. And you let things distract you. You're going to sink. Where are you going to sink? Not into hell or anything. You're going to sink with the mind of fear and the sense of perishing and, and, and that, that whole thing. And all of a sudden, you see, now it's almost like, okay, wow, uh, I didn't realize that I was walking in the supernatural and I don't let things distract me. And now I, and, and listen, even at that moment, the spirit of God is gracious enough to get you to see and to understand that where you were, were super, was supernatural. You were protected. You were operating with the weapons and you were going forward. And then all of a sudden, you and your gaze got off of, you were distracted. And you see, listen to me now. Sometimes distraction comes with good things. And that's where sometimes the way the enemy uses tricks. That's why you stay on and you stay focused on the Lord Jesus. And, and if you're dealing with revelation from the Lord, from his word, you stay focused on what he said. Because the enemy will twist the word to get you out. All he wants to do is get you out of focus of what the Lord has said to you. You see, once he gets you out of focus, then he can further bring you where you are focusing now and not on the Lord. Because you see, think about it this way. Peter was focused on Jesus. The boy walked on the water. And he walked on the water and he walked on the water until these things distracted him. And when when he was distracted, he began to deal with all the properties, all the realistic properties of water and et cetera, and thought 
that it's impossible to walk on water. It's impossible to be healed. It's impossible for my children to be delivered. It's impossible for me to get out of this. You see, that's what he wants you to think. But I listen, I know the word of God says there's nothing too hard for God. And there's nothing impossible with God. Does it not say that? But we have to be careful about our focus, especially if the Lord has said something. Listen, I think if we would pay attention to what the Lord has said and pay attention to what the Lord is saying, that we would settle down and, and we would begin to grow because we're not introducing all kinds of stuff and we're not trying to do stuff in our own strength, thinking it's a good Christian thing to do. Because the things that you want to do is you want to do what God is speaking to you and what he has put in his word. Y'all okay? Any questions? Any comments? Okay. Oh, gosh. It, it's just, uh, I, I don't know what you want to call it, I guess, to help you out. Could I call it the steps of the new era? I don't know. Somebody else got a better name for them. I mean, I, I, I just don't know. I just write them down as the Lord give them and what he give to me, and I'll, you know, I'll just put them in. So, and I have on my sheet, if you, I have the new era consists of these five things so far. I don't need to repeat them, do I? Okay, good. So truth over reality. Agreement. See, y'all making me go do a whole review, and I don't want to, I want to get to something else. It's not much, but I want to get to it. But agreement. You, you see, when I want you to catch this. When, when, when you allow the Lord to begin to deal with you and you begin to know emphatically that there is an unseen world and that you have a seat in the place of authority in that realm dealing with these things. When you get to that place, then the thing you must accomplish is have agreement with heaven. You have to come in agreement. That means you're going to have to start saying what heaven says. And you're going to have to doing it the way heaven does it. Amen. Are you listening to me? Amen. You're going to have to take what the word of God says you have and operate in what it says you have. That's coming into agreement because what you come into agreement with, that's the authority you stand in. If you come in agreement with your flesh, that's the authority you're going to stand in. And that ain't much. Okay. But when you come into agreement with heaven and you begin to deal with heaven's ways, which heaven has been sent down to occupy earth in the kingdom of God, when you begin to deal with kingdom of God principles, then you begin to see and you, it's easy for you to agree with what heaven said. And you stay in agreement on, and don't come out of it. Agreement with God is like a stronghold. And what the enemy wants to do is get you to stick your head up out of the stronghold. You remember in the Bible, in Ephesians, it talks about fiery darts. Okay? And, and a lot of us know what fiery darts are, but I want you to think of a dart. It's a very small thing. It can be focused uh, to hit a very a very strategic place. And here you are secure in God's stronghold of agreement. Now, now listen, covenant comes under agreement. Okay. And here you are in God's place hidden in the Lord. And what do you do? Mm -hmm. And the sharpshooter of the enemy is waiting for your head to stick up. And you know what happens? You stick that head up and he hits you right here with a dart. And that dart is going to be a thought. And it's going to mess you up. 
but you got to stay in agreement with heaven. You must stay in agreement with the word says. Okay, watch this. Watch this. I wanted to say this over at Pastor Steve's church. I didn't get a chance. How many of you and all that you do on the Internet and all that you do on your phones and all the new apps that you put on your phone, how many of you have read the agreement that pops up when you say and double click on that icon and and then it asks you whether you want to download it or not and you click on download and the next thing pop up is the agreement. And what do you do? And what do I do? What do you do, Brother Marcus? Do you read it? Okay, watch this. How many of you, I, I know it's none of you, but how many of you have read every agreement that you've come through dealing with those kind of things? Anybody? Every agreement. So you see, Minister Ellen raised her hand. That lets you know one thing, that she don't have that many apps dealing on her phone. <laughs> Am I right about it? I could tell you that right now. I know she don't. Because... That's what we are. Do you actually know that in some of these things that these people can, can put stuff in there that you don't know nothing about? Watch, watch this. I, you know, I wanted to really hit Brother Steve them with it. But one of the things you don't know in all these sites that you take pictures and you post and, you know, whatever. Do you know that these people own those pictures? You don't own them. They own them. Did you hear what I just said? They own them. You do not read in your agreement. See? See, we don't know that because we didn't, we didn't read the agreement. We clicked on it, but they own it. And the only reason why you don't ever come in conflict because you're not trying to take some of these pictures and do something with it because I guarantee you if you take something and want to do certain things with it and make money with it, they're going to be on your tail and let you know. And they're going to tell you, Brother Wayne, uh, excuse me, Mr. Williams, uh, you are using our picture to get funds from. And Brother Wayne's going to say, no, I'm not. I took that picture. And they're going to say, yes, sir, you surely did, but you posted it on our site. And Brother Wayne is going to say, so? And you know what they're going to say? Did you read? The agreement? Brother Wayne's going to say, well, no. Well, Mr. Williams, on page 17 and paragraph 2 and sentence this, it says that we own everything you post on our site. You with me? I'm talking about agreement. Now, thank God he's not like that. Because everything he wants us to agree is right in here, and he tells us about it, and he gives us encouragement on why to agree. But notice with agreement with God, agreement with heaven, agreement with the kingdom of God, what diametrically is opposed to that is self. When you start that of agreeing with self, of what self wants, what self want to do, it is going to eventually, and it won't take long, run diametrically opposed to what God has said. Then you're going to have to make a decision. But you see, sometimes you're going to be so emotionally into it, you're going to keep running with your decision. It's going to look, and the enemy is going to cover it over with deception, so you keep running with it. That's why you got to stick with what God said. You see, what the enemy is banking on is that you don't have any patience. What the enemy is banking on is that you don't have any self-control. He's banking on that. That you are going to get antsy because it's taking too long. You're going to pick. Now, God has said he's going to do this. But you've got antsy and you're going to jump on this. Because God is taking too long. Hmm? Remember Sarah? 
And Abraham? And I just believe that when you're in covenant together like that, God gives you opportunities not to go down that road. Sarah said it to Abraham. Abraham could have denied that. He didn't have to, but he didn't. You got to look at this story in context. Listen, there was years. I'm old. There's no way this can happen. Guess where? Guess where the word that says there is nothing too hard for God is? In Genesis 18, 14. There's nothing too hard for God. If you're going to believe God in faith for what he said, you believe him for what he said. And he's going to tell you some things if you seek him earnestly. Amen? Amen. And that is, listen, always remember, reality may not agree with what God has said. Most of the time it doesn't until God's word come to pass. Look at Joseph. Joseph had two dreams. And the word of God didn't come to pass until he went through all that he went through down in Egypt. It even says in the psalmist that the word tested him, put him in fetters. He was in fetters until that word that God had spoken to him came to pass. Now, notice, Joseph wasn't so much distracted, but the grace of God was upon him. Let me tell you what grace is. If you ever get to the place to say, you know, I don't know how God did it, but my bills are paid. We're not hungry. You hear what I'm telling you? It is the grace of God that is kicked in to keep you in a place until God's promise come to fruition. Agreement. Can I leave that? Anybody? Comments? See, the first agreement you have with God, and this first agreement that you have with God governs the rest of your life. The Lord, I'm a sinner. My heart is desperately wicked. And so this agreement that brings forth repentance out of you should always be in place in your life. You should always be seeking God and asking God, Lord, anything in me that is not like you today, anything I picked up, anything I said, Lord, you, you should do that. It's a, it's a cleansing affair. It gets you ready to be a vessel for the master's use because there are things in this realm of unseen that you have, you have committed not fully understanding that these spiritual things are in place and they're not going anywhere and you can't laugh them off and you can't talk them off. You got to take authority over them and deal with them. They're not going anywhere. They're not going to move. I don't care how much church you come to. I don't care how much preaching you come to. You got to get the word of God on that thing and the faith of God in your heart dealing with that thing so that in the realm of the spirit, it moves because it has to move when God said it has to move and you're believing it. Amen? Amen. Okay. The next thing we have was displacement. Displacement. And basically all displacement is is that when we start with God, and we don't, I don't think some of us believe this. When we start with God, there are dark places inside of us. Even when salvation, even the, the, the light has come. And there's dark places still inside of us. And listen, I am telling you, the Lord is a vicious warrior. He is going to reveal those places to you. Why he reveals it to you? Because you have authority to do something about it. You just didn't see it. You just didn't think it was a dark place. But I want you to understand the principle. Listen to me. Demonic forces don't travel in light. They hate the light. They have to have a dark place. This thing all works. Just think about it. Man, I tried reading the other night. Uh, my lamp in my bed is, I'm laying like this, and it's over here. And so I'm over here trying to read, and, I, you know, I could barely see the words. And I start rubbing my eyes and all that. Okay, I, maybe I need glasses of this. But you know one thing? If I got close to the light, I could see it. 
That's all it took. There was nothing wrong with my eyes. I just had to get some light on the situation. Okay, come on. Could we be just downright elementary? Well, what happens when you're in the dark? You can, one, you can't see where you're going, right? Anything else? Is, it all, is that the only thing that darkness brings that you just can't see where you're going? Hmm? Yes, sir. It's dangerous. Frustration, fear. What else? Right? Unknown. The boogeyman. But you know what? Let's let's do this. Watch this. I'm, could I use y'all two back there? Yeah, good. Uh, Minister Ellis has a. Uh, has a living room set up. And, and Brother Glenn knows she's got it set up just like she wants. She is never going to change it. She's never. And Brother Glenn's out working all the time, and he comes in late, and he doesn't want to turn on the light. But he knows where the furniture is. Now, come on, y'all got, y'all better grab this, grab this whole, he knows where it is because she never changes it. He knows when he opens up the door that when he walks in, he has to immediately turn to his right and he has to veer past the coffee table and make a loop and come around and, and come around some other stuff to get to the, he knows that it never changes. It's solid. It's there. Now. It could be pitch black. He knows where it is. Y'all with me? Now, I'm telling you, this will preach. And we all probably can get a message from it. Now, I know you might be expecting me to say that Minister Ellen kind of get, you know, crazy and move all the stuff. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Brother Glenn knows she's not going to move it. It's there. Night after night, week after week, he comes in late, boom. Always. You never hear him hit his toe. You never hear him say, that woman you gave me, Lord, I need to do something or choke her. You know, he, he never says that because he never hits his toe and he never bumps anything. Why can he do that? Come on, tell me. Because he knows where he's going. This is why the Lord is able to lead you in darkness. Did y'all hear what I just said? Y'all didn't hear that. This is why the Lord is able to lead you in darkness. Have you ever saw the scripture that he'll give you the treasures of darkness? See, y'all hadn't seen that. But this is why you're able, and you see, because the way we think is that we must have light to see things, and we do. We need light, but you know what else we need? We need knowledge and understanding, and we need to trust in the word, and we need to be able to that when we don't know, when we, when we can't, when we don't know his plan, and we can't see his hand, we trust his heart. You listening to me? Because does the word of God change? You see why? You see why Brother Glenn could trust walking through there? Because she never changed the furniture. The word of God don't change. Jesus Christ the same. Okay, y'all waking up a little bit. We'll go another hour. We'll get you fully woken up there. Okay? All right. But we're talking about agreement and then displacement. Okay? Are you listening to me? You can't tell me that there's times you've walked in your life to where it's, just, it's almost like you just couldn't see. You were walking in darkness. And you know what, what you have to do when that happens? You have to trust the Lord. I'm just telling you, you're going to have to trust the Lord. Because you don't realize sometimes how all of us want to know what God's plan is, and then we want to have faith. <laughs> it don't work that way. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of what? 
Mm. Okay. All right. So displacement simply is, and this is the basic thing about displacement. You keep walking with the Lord. He is going to reveal these dark places and move them out of you. The light is going to dispel the darkness. And, and you don't have, listen, I, and I know you already know this, the darkness can't overcome the light. It can't. So as God begins in his word by his word and by his word being proven out in you, it is going to slowly in your mind and in your heart move out the darkness, displace it. And if you keep allowing yourself to be submitted to the word of God, submitted to what God has said, being obedient, it's going to move out the darkness in many places of your life and you're going to be walking in light. And one of the things that's going to happen when you begin to walk in the light is you're going to begin to see things that you didn't see before. You're going to begin to understand things that you didn't understand before. You're going to see things that's operating in your children. You're going to see stuff that's operating in your house. You're going to see things with your husband and your wife. You're going to begin to see those things because the light has come. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Grace abounds more. See? Sure it does. It dispels it. It displaces it. It moves it off. It does everything to eradicate it. So displacement. See, this is for all of us. I don't care how long you've been in the Lord. That is going to happen with you as you walk with the Lord. That these things in your life that brings forth darkness and its dark areas is going to be displaced. And I see it. it. It is like here's a dark area and the word of God comes up against that and the darkness can't deal with it. The only way you stay in darkness is if you want to and you protect it. And sometimes we do that simply because of that this dark area in us has an attachment, a fleshly attachment to us. We feel it emotionally uh, or whatever. That's why we don't, we don't turn it loose and that's why we don't let the word of God change that area for us. But if we release ourselves, see, another thing that work in displacement is teaching. As you are being taught the word of God, it begins to displace some of these erroneous things that's in your mind. Never before in the history of the world has erroneous and false things been put out on the airways like it is now. There is some junk out there that's unbelievable. Hmm? And everybody's got an opinion. What did, what did you tell me, Sister Diane, about this concert? You said some. Uh, you said what did you say? You said there were people protesting. What were they? Okay, they were saying what now? That um, contemporary Christian music is it of God or is it of? Uh, okay, all right. Also, they were they were protesting that the gospel is free. We ought not to be paying. To to I'm, I am telling you, I'm telling you. I don't care what side of the fence you're on. We're in a crazy time. Hmm. Okay. Now, removing strongholds. Removing strongholds. I really want to begin to seek the Lord for him to show us. I think we, we basically know and we may have said it, but I want us to come into it all together that the Lord would identify the strongholds of our city. I mean, I, once again, we've been down this road before. But I, I want us to go down the road together, and I want you to join me in prayer. Lord, reveal unto us. Help us discern what is the strongholds of our city. Now, the reason why I say that is uh, with my time, well, let me finish this one, and then we'll deal with uh, how taking the city fits in with the dawning of a new era. Let me, let me just finish this. Strongholds. And... And this deals with 
not only uh, us understanding strongholds and pulling them down in our life, but helping other people pull them down. Uh, somebody find 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. Whoever finds it first, read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I think it's verse 7. Come on, I know it don't take you all that long. In other versions, it says it talks about weapons of righteousness. Talks about weapons. This is a, the, we interjected ourselves in a passage where Paul is talking about the ministry of how the ministry should not be an offense to people. Listen, when you are ministering the gospel and preaching the love of God and that offends people, you keep preaching because you're doing what God said. Amen. Don't ever try to say what it doesn't say and bring it down to the human level, not human level of understanding, but human level of acceptance. God's not acting, asking people to accept him. There's a sign on Highway 90, a company that they always put up that, you know, they're Christian people. And you see the sign up there a lot, except Jesus. Ain't nobody want to accept Jesus. That's too many other things they accept. You receive Christ. Because, see, that's the gospel. The gospel is not so much. I, listen, and one thing I really love, I wish I had time to get into, and that is, uh, what is it called? It's, it's not called debating, but it's, ta it, it's called standing in the faith, defending the faith. I like that. Because there's so many ideologies out in the world that come with so many different things. One of the, one of the guys, I love his ministry, and I'm just uh, flabbergasted that I understand sometimes what he's talking about. And that's Ravi Zacharias. I mean, he talk about some heavy stuff. But you can understand it. You really can. And it is, it is a defend the faith ministry. I mean, he goes on to college campuses and deals with a lot of people that don't believe in and express the gospel. There, he has one teaching that is masterful. Somebody asked a question about, you know, good morals and, 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 and how that has a real part in people being saved. And, man, he jumped on that and diffused that. I'm telling you, good morals uh, is, is just not something that saves you. It, it could be a function of knowing who the Lord is and et cetera. And you see a lot of people that doesn't know the Lord may have good morals, but it doesn't save them. That's the real bottom line issue. It doesn't save them. And people think, look, I'll give you an example. I just, I was telling uh, uh, Monice here, I was telling, I met her husband over at one of the uh, it's not a nursing home. What do you call that? Uh, assisted living homes. And uh, I, uh, I took the, the job up of that. There was this guy. He was just being radical, doing all this stuff that was going on and, and et cetera. And uh, the people were having trouble with him. And so finally he started calling all over the place and, and, and said he, he didn't have any money and he didn't have any groceries and didn't have anything to eat. And so in the meeting, I said, I'll go talk to him. And I went on yesterday, and I went talk to him. And listen, guys, let me tell you something. A respect for human beings is important. Approaching people the way you approach them is important. I'm not talking about approaching with shabby bay. I'm talking about approaching with the love of God. And, and make a long story short, did what I needed to do. Uh, and so when I got back and had to report in the meeting, some of, some of these folks says, oh, this is their exact words. Oh, you're going to really make it to heaven because of what you did. <laughs> and I said, not so. Be because the general consensus, and it's out there, it's in people, that if you do good, that, that is going to get you into heaven. That's the general consensus. 
And they don't understand that they've been fighting to do good all their life. And sometimes they do good and sometimes they do bad. And they don't really understand what is the standard that makes things good and make things bad. Yes, sir. Ain't no good people in heaven. <laughs> not good because they were good to that, okay, they, they saved. That's not. See, that's the bottom line issue. I think we allow our emotions and everything to get in it. It is actually what you're dealing with when it comes to salvation. That's the bottom line. Now, um, removing strongholds. And so we're dealing with that. We're learning about them so that we can pull those things down in our life and we can help others do the same. Because the enemy loves to build, that, that's always going to be his strategy. If you're walking, and, and listen to me, and I'm going to move on to the next. This blue carpet is the will of God. What the enemy want to get you to do and you're looking straight ahead. He want to distract you. Okay? And once he distracts you, you're going to look. You may waver a little bit because you got your eye off the target. But you may keep walking. But he knows he's got something, a place. And so what he does is he waits for an opportune time to distract you again. Where it causes you to wobble and get out of the will of God. Now, listen, when he gets you in a place where he wants you to be, where he wants to be, he wants to get you in that place and he wants you to stay in that place. So he will start to work on establishing a stronghold in your life because he don't want to get out. And guys, listen, this is relentless warfare you have to be on it and you can't tell me and I'm not proposing the flesh side of it trying to tell you to do it but what I'm saying is we got to stay on task the things that we know we got to stay on task and begin to understand that there are things that happen in your life that cause you to get out of task you want me to show you, give you some simple things? I'll give you a couple. You give me the rest. Being tired and trying to deal with spiritual things. The Lord showed me something with someone. And this is what he showed me. The person looked weak and unable and, and is so succumbed to a stronghold of nicotine in their life that is going to eventually dry them up to where they have no life force left. And, and what is that? See, that's why when you're dealing with spiritual things and deliverance, there is, with, there is in us a, a sense of appetite to where we go to something, go to something, go to something, and we begin to develop in ourselves, a need for it, and boom, spiritual forces jump right on that. Because if it's not doing the correct thing in your body, you try to walk away from it, and all of a sudden it has such an attachment inside of you that you can't. Now, I know I'm, I know I'm way out there with you, but I'm out there. And I need you to understand that because one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And so, so that there are things that stay balanced in your life so that it gives no place for the enemy to jump in and begin to create something in your life that begins to take the life force out of you. Because it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen with our appetites. It'll begin to do it. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Across the board. That's exactly right. Across the board, it happens. 
And, and we have to understand it is, it is meant to bring us into bondage. And if you let it go, and if you're watching, and I'm talking about 3, 4, 5, 10, 12, 15 years. If you watch it, it's constantly stealing life out of you to where you just kind of start to dry up, your health get real bad, and et cetera, and, and, all, and you're coming down to a place where you're battling for your life. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, in just what you said, you can think negatively about this thing. Yeah, you can, you can really do. But because the only reason why that is so is because what you are dealing with is seeking to take control of you and bring you somewhere else that you don't want to go. And, and so you need fences up in your life, you know, to keep you from going certain places. And I don't mean literally going certain places, but you understand what I'm saying. You need that. Spiritually. Thank you. Okay. And the last one in, in this new era is uproot the spirit of Jezebel. All I'm going to say on that is that spirit is more prevalent in our churches than we could ever know. We need discernment concerning that spirit. And, and here's, here's a fact of the matter. That even, as I told you in the book of Revelation, that that spirit was something that had to be dealt with in the churches. And listen, whenever I get to that, the thing that I want us to be ingrained upon is that the spirit of Jezebel is not a woman. It's a spirit. And you got to change the way you speak. Start a, stop assigning this to your wife and to your sister and to people in the congregation because you're literally saying that person is and you're speaking about a spirit. But we'll deal with that. Okay, look. This book is in which we're dealing with, okay, I talked a little bit about, uh, let's see, section one has two parts, I believe. Section, is it sections? Yeah. Section one says battle stories, and it has two parts. It has seven time. Seventh time around is one part, and then the discerning of spirits is two. See? And when you take the dawning of a new era and you mesh taking the city together, one of the first things that you see is that all things, all direction, instructions, plans, and strategy must come from God, must come from God, must come from God. We talk about the dawning of a new era, but it all comes from God. Everything. When you deal with chapter section one, uh, section one, number one, it's going to talk about the seventh time around. And I want you to see it. It uses for an example... Joshua chapter 6. Turn there. Uh, actually, actually, I want to start in chapter 5, verse 13. All things, directions, instructions, plans, strategies must come from God. Joshua 5, 13, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? This had to be an awesome warrior. I mean, come on, look at it this way. Okay, watch this. Um, I can never forget um, when I first arrived at the Giants, I was kind of enamored with some of these personalities because I saw some of them on TV. But as when I started to practice with them and et cetera, they regular people just like you and I. And people get enamored with 
those kind of things. They, I mean, they really do, and I understand why. And, but, but here's what I'm getting at. A, a great football player is not necessarily enamored with another football player because they know it. Joshua was a great warrior. So he shouldn't be enamored with another warrior, but he is. That's why you know this warrior was something that he had never seen before. And not only was his presence awesome, you see, he had a sword and it was drawn. Meaning that this warrior was ready for action. And so it prompted Joshua to ask because I think what he was thinking in his mind was, and I'm going to put it in my vernacular, if this dude is not for us, we don't stand a chance. One, just one, if he's not for us. But notice what he said. Joshua said, are you for us or are you for our enemy? And notice what the commanders of the Lord's army said. In one version, he said, neither. Now, why is that significant? I mean, you know, come on, guys, guys, all you Bible scholars, to us, he should have said, you for Joshua. Well, think about it. He's got all God's people standing at the brink of God's promise, ready to take the land. Joshua's out here dealing and wondering what he needs to do. And this awesome warrior shows up, and he's got to be for us. <laughs> no. And he told him, he said, no. He said, I'm for neither. You know why he said neither? Anybody? This is why he said, yes, sir. Yes. Well, let, let me let her go first. Go ahead, sis. Because God is for all of you. See, it's God's will. And saying that, that means you have a choice. Now, so here, here's, here's the picture, okay? Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, no, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come, okay? So all of Joshua's inclination of how great this warrior is, is now coming to pass. Why? Because he falls on his face. Because he knows he is in the presence of something great and he can't deal with it. The only way I can deal with it is bow before it. And that's what he does. But he also does the thing that we ought to do. Look at it. In verse 14. He bowed his face to the ground and worship and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? That's what you ought to do as you worship and pray. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm yours to command. What do you want me to do? First thing, I want you to worship. Take your shoes off. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off, so forth and so on. Now, here is the part I want us to get to. And I'm going to close with, with, with this part. Okay. And I'm saying when you talk about taking the city, the first thing that you must do, all things, all direction, all instructions, plans, strategy, must come from the Lord. And it means something. I'm, I'm going to just tell you what it means. When we say it must come from the Lord, I'm going to tell you in a moment what it means. But look at this, verse 1 of Joshua 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see. What did he say? See. See what? I have given into the hand of Had they taken it? What does it say, sis? Uh, I am about to defeat Jericho for you. Okay, that's another version. I don't like that one. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. No one was allowed to go mm-hmm. out or in. Mm-hmm. Next verse, read it. Next verse. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. Mm-hmm. Okay, stop there. I, you need to catch the picture before we close. You need to catch the picture. He told Joshua, come on, take a look. It's already yours. Why? Why is it already yours? Because every person in there is afraid of you. Now, listen, now we're talking about in the realm of the spirit. See, this is why fear is something to deal with in your life. There is the fear of God, and there is that fear that, that people uh, that God will allow people to see that he is guarding you. There are angelic beings that guard you. There are, see, awesome, and in that realm, fear has its place. Fear has its place, period. And they were fearful. Jericho was fearful of the people of Israel. What they really feared was the God of Israel. That's why testimony works. There's many people testify to them and say, hmm, man, them people didn't come up against you. I hate to tell you, but there's a God fighting for them. And nobody's defeated him. And there's been a lot of people say that he's weak, but he ain't weak. These people come out of Egypt, and y'all know how strong Egypt is, and they come out of Egypt, and he delivered. Do you know that their God turned water into blood? And they keep rehearsing the things of God, keep rehearsing the things of God, tearing down the kingdom, bringing fear from the Lord on the people. Listen, the command of the Lord's army say, take a look, Joshua, it's already yours. The city and its king. Okay, okay. Can I ask y'all a question? What would you have done if the Lord told you that with your mindset? Now, now, come on, you got to play along with me now because you got the word and you know what Joshua done. I don't want that. I want, if God told you, okay, you see it, it's yours. <laughs> Y'all got something over here? How are you going to do it, Lord? <laughs> see, see, they, 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 they well afford of knowing what you need to do. But how many of you know, I learned this early in the ministry, that the Lord spoke something to me. And when I heard it, whether I was laying prostrate or on my knees, I jumped right up and went after it. And you know why I went after it? Because the Lord spoke it. I didn't wait for instruction. He said, this is that way. Boom, I went that way. And it wasn't until about two or three times I did that, that one day he spoke something to me that he wanted me to do. And when I got up and I did this, he said, wait, I froze. And that's when he spoke on the in, inside of my spirit. He said, every time I tell you of something I want you to do or I'm going to do, you don't sit and wait for instructions. Because you know what was happening? I was going to do what he said, and there was alligators chasing me all around. And I was tripping up. And and you know what was happening? One of the times, I went back and I said, "Mm, okay, he didn't speak to me. That wasn't God. And the reason why I said that is because what I felt like God told me he wanted me to do, I went in and did it exactly like he said, and it didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work was there was alligators and et cetera, and I needed more insight from the Lord on how to do it. Because that's what he told Joshua. He said, see, giving you the city. It's already yours. But this is how you're going to possess it. Walk around it. And he talks about, y'all know the story. And, and because that doesn't make sense, we push it off. Because it doing the will of God presses upon our status and what we think and a lot of times upon our intelligence. 
because we think somebody going to see us doing this goofy thing, and they just, they're going to think I'm crazy. And so, guess what? We don't do it because of status. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And it, and, and it don't, you don't grow out of that. I don't care how old you are. You better wait for the instructions of the Lord. The Lord may tell you that he's going to do a thing, okay? But you got to wait for instructions so you know how you're going to possess this thing. Can you think of now, see, what you need to do is go research. See how big the walls were at Jericho and the city and how prominent it was and all those kinds of things. And now know that a whole city is shut up against a nation of people, okay, and they're afraid of them. And then what you need to catch is the atmosphere here is when they start marching around with their mouth closed. Could I tell you, look, listen to me. Now listen to me. It's in this book. Read it. It's in the book. The first one, seventh time around. It's in that. They marched around that wall, didn't say a word. What if that was us? We were given instructions to march around that wall. Since Crystal is there, Moniz is there, everybody's there, and we all committed to quietness. Since Crystal start talking. And then somebody on the wall hollers at, hey, you down there with the red hair. I don't like your mama. And what does Sister Crystal say? She start hollering stuff back. That's it. She didn't broke the instructions. They were commanded to keep their mouth closed. It didn't matter what they said on the wall. Keep your mouth closed. It doesn't matter the ridicule that they shout down at you. Talk about your mama ain't Susu, ain't whoever. It didn't matter. Keep your mouth closed and just march. Now, the first and second time is, is, is just tough. But after the third, fourth, fifth time, it's beginning to have an impact on these people. And can you imagine? All you hear is the footsteps of an army of people going around your city. And you're shouting obscenities and curses at them, and they're not saying anything but keep walking. And, and when they get done, they go back to their camp. And about the third time you figured out what they're going to do, okay, here they come. What are they doing? I wonder how long they're going to march around this thing. On that seventh time, remember, on the seventh time, how many times they marched around? Do you think the people of Jericho caught the change? I guarantee you they caught it. When they ran around that one time and they saw him going around the second time, say, oh, they're doing something different. Let's watch them. Check them out. Maybe we got them. Maybe what they're doing is not working. You see, because there's going to be people, and in, in, listen, listen to me, that this is the graciousness of this story, that everybody came on board and did the same thing. <laughs> They didn't have to deal with rebels, not yet. They didn't have to deal with somebody doing something different, not yet. And that's what I like about God's strategy. When God's strategy come, it sometimes it just it's it's out of the ordinary and nobody can say nothing but do what God says. Because sometimes we try to put our little understanding on, but they all did the same thing. 